everyone. Welcome back to the Artcast. This is uh, episode number three. I'm your host, Ryan Abraham, joined alongside the legendary leader of the Trojan Marching Band, Dr. Arthur C. Bartner. Dr. Bartner, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I always look look forward to these art casts. These are fun. I like the art cast uh, title. You can find them on YouTube on the Trojan Marching Band uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you can also they put it up on all the different podcasting apps. So we like the video version because we're going to show you some cool stuff. Uh, and you can see Dr. Bartner and I talking about everything. Uh, it's going to be another interesting show today. So this is going to focus on the 1974 uh, football season. So if you remember the big comeback against Notre Dame, Anthony Davis, the uh, Notre Dame killer. So that was a, that was a big one there. And then also uh, the really exciting Rose Bowl against Ohio State, the third time the Trojans and the uh, Buckeyes had played. So we're going to go over all that with Dr. Bartner, some of the some memories from the 1974 season. And then also, uh, this is actually something we tried to do in the first episode. We had some audio problems, so we're going to come back with this. The Trojan Marching Band Game Day Traditions, they've been the same uh, for like 50 years. So we're going to talk about the, what those game day traditions are. And then later on, like different episode, we will go on what happens during the game. But this is all of the stuff, all the traditions for the Trojan Marching Band uh, surrounding the game. So uh, it's a pretty good show. I know those traditions have to be pretty special to you, Dr. Barton. I can't wait to get into the uh, after we talk some football. Well, this, this 19... Uh, 74 game is one of my favorites. It's one of those games that people turn off the TV at halftime and blow the game off, and then they wake up on Saturday morning and pull the L.A. Times out and go, we won, we won. How did, how did that happen? So uh, I love reliving this game. Yes, it's one of those things where you can't leave. So you've never been in those situations where you walked away and weren't able to go. You guys have to stay there the whole time. So uh, there's no chance that anyone in the band is going to be leaving. But I'm sure there's a lot of fans, probably people that are watching this, that, yep, I left at halftime. <laughs> right, right, uh, right. I, I had a grandfather in, in Florida who, you know, cursing the tea, uh, you know, a rabbit fan cursing the tv and fire john mckay you know you know all that stuff and then he you know, turned it off and then he woke up the next day and he just couldn't believe it it's one of the the great comebacks of of all time yeah it certainly is and so let's go back to the 1974 uh season so if you remember that we're going to talk about those two games uh but coming into the season USC was ranked number five. Uh, they went on the road and lost to Arkansas in Little Rock, 22 to seven. But after that, went on a good run. Uh, you know, nine in a row. Uh, nine, uh, you know, didn't didn't lose for nine in a row. There was that one tie to Cal in there, and then that set up this regular season finale against uh, number five Notre Dame in the Coliseum. Obviously, the big rivalry. I mean, you know, USC Notre Dame goes mm -hmm. you know forever, and it wasn't really good. First half showing, Dr. Barton. I don't know. Maybe we start with that. It was 24 0 Notre Dame. Uh, I mean, what, what were you guys thinking in the band at that point? Well, you know, again, our, our philosophy is we never give up on the team. You know, you're, you're, you're always, hey, you, you play to the bitter end of the game, and, uh, you know, you're saying to yourself, uh, you know, this team's going to come back. And, and the fact that we got to score, like, right before halftime, you know, you know, right before we took the field for our halftime show, it gave us that spark to say, yeah, we're believers. This team's going to come back. Yeah, so, you mentioned that. So it was 24 nothing, and then uh, right before halftime, Pat Hayden throws a pass to Anthony Davis, touchdown. It's funny, I've done some different speaking events with uh, – Anthony Davis, and you know, he would tell this halftime story that, you know, uh, John McKay was saying, "We're going to go out, and you're going to return the opening kickoff for a touchdown. And we're going to come back in this game." Um, I mean, well, what were you guys thinking? Was there was there some momentum with that late touchdown? I mean, you missed the extra point, which sort of like, uh, you know, um, yeah. but did that that must have created some momentum. You know, uh, I was very excited about halftime, the halftime show. Because I'm a huge Broadway fan, and uh, 
we had an iconic Broadway couple, uh, Carol Lawrence, who was the original Maria in West Side Story. She sang the national anthem. And her husband, Robert Goulet, uh, was Sir Lancelot in uh, Camelot. And, you know, he sang a number at halftime. So we had st two great Broadway stars, and it almost made up for the debacle that was a football game. Yeah, so you guys get excited about that. And we have, uh, I'm going to play you a video here in a second. Uh, and they show Robert Goulet, uh, you know, at the halftime mm -hmm. show. So that's pretty cool. Uh, but it's a stunned Coliseum. Because you know it's it's twenty four to six. Let me play uh, this video. If you're on uh, on the podcast, if you're just audio only, you should still be able to hear what's going on in the broadcast. Legendary uh, announcer Tom Kelly is on this, so I'll play this for you, and then we'll kind of get your reaction afterwards, uh, Dr. Bardner. Okay, great. Here we go. Tom Kelly with you at intermission here at the Coliseum, where about eighty some thousand have sat and kind of stunned disbelief. Not all of them, because a good many of the eighty thousand are pulling for the Irish of Notre Dame. And they've had a happy first half, as Notre Dame has completely dominated this great collegiate rivalry, this edition of it, leading 24-6 to here at the intermission. Notre Dame will kick off. All right, McLaughlin advances on the football. It's been an Irish afternoon as he boots it high and long and deep. In the end zone, Davis coming out at the 10. 15, 20, coming out at the 30. He's at the 30. Takes the snap to pitch to Davis. Leaping white right at the five. He dies. He's in the end zone. Anthony Davis has scored again. Trojans with an opportunity to go in front for the first time. First and goal. The pitch to Davis. He's at the five. He's in the end zone. Touchdown, USC. Clements back to pass. Sets up. Fires over the middle. It is intercepted. Picked off by Phillips at the 40. The 30. The 20. The 15. Score here at the Coliseum is USC 55, Notre Dame 24. Pretty crazy. Uh, 24 to nothing to 55 to 24. Most USC fans. Now, it's funny to see Anthony Davis carrying that like a loaf of bread sometimes, like right through the line. Like anyone could have popped that ball out. But just, I mean, obviously one of the greatest comebacks in uh, USC football and college football yeah. history. Well, the that opening uh, kickoff and AD's return, uh, I think, is, is one of the great moments in Trojan history because uh, not only was a great run, and a lot of people don't don't remember that Mosi Tadupu threw a great block at about the 35-yard line that just sprung him, and then you know, nobody could catch him. But it energized the crowd. I mean, all of a sudden, the crowd came alive, and, and everybody was on their feet screaming and hollering, and the energy in that stadium was just unbelievable after that after that run back yeah the uh so for the you had the two um uh excuse, yeah so the two touchdowns by anthony davis uh it was a 35 point i believe uh third quarter it just kind of everything goes crazy at that point i mean what was the what was the crowd like what was everything there that you saw like after yeah. you know eventually when the usc takes the lead there had to be like the big momentum shift too well yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like great play after great play, and and our our defense was just amazing. I mean, Charles Phillips made a couple of interceptions. Uh, one he was on the video that he just ran back untouched, and then he made another one that set up a touchdown. Uh, 
Also, uh, another guy who, who became a very good friend of mine, Marvin Cobb, he ran a punt back for something like 50, 60 yards and set up another touchdown. I, I mean, it was like uh, this great Notre Dame uh, team just kind of laid down and, and let us do whatever we wanted to do. So it was just an amazing thing. And, uh, you know, it's like the band never sat down. <laughs> we never sat down, but it seemed like we were we played Conquest over and over and over, and, and the horse. And I think, I think John McKay he said something like, "Geez, we almost killed the horse." I mean, in, <laughs> in a short amount of time, he ran out. What uh, seven times? It was crazy. For was 55 points in like 17 minutes, I mean, the, the horse probably got, you know, Traveler probably got a little tired. Did, did the band members kind of get tired when that, like, you have to keep playing constantly like that? No, no, no. You know, they, they, they get so excited in the game that, you know, you don't, you don't think that your, your lips are getting tired and you're running out of air. You don't even think about that. You know, you're just so focused on the game that, uh, you know, I, I I don't think I've ever had a complaint uh, when we're winning a game. Yeah. Now, if we, if we weren't playing well, and yeah, yeah, they start to you know complain a little bit, but but they were just elated yeah. about what was occurring on the on the football field. Real quick on that along that subject, is there a, a one of the um, you know instruments that's probably the hardest or most taxing to play, and what would be the easiest for band members? Well, you know, the, the, the toughest is the tuba because okay. you, you got That's like you, you, got 40, <laughs> you got 40 pounds, you know, sitting on your shoulder and the amount of air uh, that you have to get through all that tubing and out this big, huge bell. Uh, That's that's definitely the most demanding. I think drums it's the most fun. Yeah, this seems. And they're just hitting them. <laughs> and they're just like, you know, it's a matter of trying to get them under control <laughs> more than anything else. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, like, the drums probably look like the most fun, but you do have to carry, like, you're, a lot, you're carrying something heavy, not maybe as heavy as the, tu as the tuba, but they look like they have the most fun out there. Right. Well, we put the, we put the drums on stands so they don't have to oh. hold them. Because, because, yeah, that, that would be tough to hold those for, you know, a 60-minute game. But we put them on stands, and so they just have to <laughs> mail away at them. And, and it's, uh, yeah, if I had to come back to the band, I'd play the drums, man. <laughs> that fun. Well, 1974, the Notre Dame game, there was a lot of drum playing, a lot of tuba play, a lot of everything because, like I said, so many touchdowns in that short span. A great comeback uh, for USC, but... Then you head off uh, to the Rose Bowl. So January 1st, uh, obviously the next year, uh, 1975, the, like I said earlier, the third consecutive meeting uh, between mm -hmm. USC and Ohio State in the Rose Bowl. Uh, Woody Hayes brought the Buckeyes. They were ranked number three in the AP, two in the coaches. They were hoping for a national championship with the win. Right. And they come in as a six-point favorite. Do you remember some of the lead-up uh, to that game at all? Uh, well, it, it's uh, – well, Number one, Ohio State has a great band, a wonderful band. And uh, we, I mean, this is the third time, as you said, we played them. So we got to know those guys very well. And, you know, we've had, you know, had a battle of the bands and we exchanged tunes. And so there was a real rivalry just between bands. And since we had split the first two games, uh, this was kind of the the rubber match. So, uh, yeah, the tensions were, were pretty high. And, uh, you know, after the Rose Parade, uh, the two bands kind of kind of meet. And, you know, we we sh share McDonald burgers. And uh, so the battle of the band was was pretty intense. There was a lot of finger pointing. You know, there was a lot of competition there so uh yeah it was 
that's what makes it fun. Yeah. The, the, you got at the time, uh, were the bands both marching in the Rose Parade as well that morning? Yes. Yes. So there was, uh, but it, it, again, uh, it's, it's a very demanding day. And the only break you get is, is the bus ride from, uh, you know, a, a park and, you know, wherever that park is at the end of the parade to the, to the Rose Bowl. So that's the only break you get. So you just crash for 15, 20 minutes and that's it. And then you, you go out and play the game. Yeah. Well, in the game, uh, so it was the Heisman winner, Archer Griffith, uh, uh, Griffin, and uh, Anthony Davis, obviously the great running back from USC. Pretty low scoring, though. It was, what, 7-3 at uh, halftime, and, and no, another one scored in the third quarter either. Right. It was a real defensive slugfest. So set that up. So like we said, 7-3, Ohio State's winning, going into the fourth quarter. Uh, Hay Hayden Obradovich, I believe it was, gets uh, the uh, go-ahead touchdown. Right. But then Ohio State goes on and scores 10 more. So there's this, after no scoring for a long time, there's a score fest. And USC's down again, and then uh, this happens. So I want to play, I'll play these highlights for you, and then we'll kind of talk about them. Here's Hayden setting up. Oh! Boy, has he got time. He's throwing deep to McKay, and it's a touchdown! He's got him for a touchdown! has always been a gambler. I wonder what he'll do now. They're going for two. They could win it. If they blow it, they can lose it. Hayden throws, and he has it. Sheldon Diggs has it. And USC has the lead. Sheldon Diggs for two points. What a wind-up. This one is going to be 58 yards. The kick is up. It is up. It is short. The touchback. The game is over. And USC pouring back on an 80-yard drive in the last two minutes defeated Ohio State. USC gambled and went for the win on the two-point option and beat the Buckeyes in one of the all-time throws. Yeah, 18-17, uh, going for two, obviously. Um, you know, when it works, it's great, and uh, you take the lead there. I don't, what was, what's well, the band thinking? Those got that kind of situation. Like, that's a – I mean, that's – Yeah. This game was uh, a little bit reminiscent of uh, – Another game, the, uh, the the Reggie Bush push, where there was a great pass, you know, towards the end of the game. And uh, Pat Hayden to J.K. McKay, you know, McKay was, uh, there was magic. I mean, there was magic. Those two grew up together, played high school football together. And uh, that long pass uh, for a touchdown, uh, set up, you know, a very gutsy call by Coach McKay to go for two points. And Pat Hayden did not go to J.K. McKay. He went to uh, Sheldon Diggs. Yeah. Which probably surprised Ohio State uh, a little bit. So uh, what a what a great outcome. Anytime you... You kind of win on the last play of the game is is so exciting. Yeah, that was a, that was crazy, and there was still a little time left. Ohio State had that uh, long field goal attempt at the end that fell short. But yeah, I mean, do you remember John John McK you know John McKay doing stuff like that a lot? Where hey, let's, we're going to go for the win here, you know? Yes, I, I I I think that you know, and again, I don't know if these were games that I was present at, but his. His history was you always go for the win. You know, you, you, you never play for a tie. Uh, you, know, you know, we're here to, to win a ball game. Uh, the other thing that I remember that, you know, back in that day, the band was sitting on the field in the corner of the end zone. So, uh, and, and it, all this action at the end of the game was 
in our end zone. Oh, okay. So, you know, you can see the, the, the band in the background. When, when McKay caught that pass, there's a couple of band guys that broke rank and ran out and <laughs> hugging the guy. I mean, that's a no-no, but, yeah. you know, you get, <laughs> you get caught up in the moment. But the fact that the band was just right there in the action, uh, you never forget that. Yeah. That's similar. Uh, wasn't that the same case like for Notre Dame games too, that the band would have to be on the field like in the corners there? Yes. And, and it's interesting. It's the same end zone, but we were on the other side. Okay. Uh, instead of on the, I guess that's the uh, – northeast side we were on the northwest side so but but yes and and now today uh you know the rose bowl find us found us seats in the other end zone and notre dame has this skied us yeah. on the scoreboard yeah i think once notre dame expanded the stadium probably right then it was the big right. yeah yeah you know, so uh and, and and i have to must admit that I, who stand on a ladder in front of the band, it could get very dangerous when I start running plays that go around that end. Uh, I'm usually, you know, r run for cover, you know, and <laughs> pull the ladder away because uh, it, it can, we're, you know, we're maybe five feet, six feet away from the sideline. So you're, you're, you're pretty close to the action. Yeah, no, you can. Uh, you're right in there. You're the <laughs> crazy stuff. Uh, well, so anyway, that was John McKay's uh, eighth and last Rose Bowl appearance. Fifth time he won. Uh, so you don't, you have a better record than he does, but uh, pretty good. Uh, and then Alabama to losing the Sugar Bowl uh, to Notre Dame. So USC wins the UPI National Championship, and it was McKay's fourth and last championship at USC. So sort of a crazy season with that. Big comeback win over Notre Dame, and then Notre Dame sort of helping USC at the end uh, get a share of the title. Yes, yeah, it was it, you know what a terrific career, and and it, and it's interesting that uh, uh, I I never spent much time with John McKay. You know, my interaction was always with Marv Gu. Marv Gu was a spirit, the catalyst of that football team. And, and he just brought me and a band into that team. And, and we had an unbelievable partnership. And then after John, interesting story, when John went to Tampa Bay and, uh, you know, he left USC, he and I became very good friends. And, and he expressed that he appreciate, appreciated what the band brought to Trojan football. So so after the fact, uh, you know, he and I had developed a very good relationship. It's interesting. Well, I mean, you just started there in 70, right? So you're sort of kind of feeling out how you're going to be doing this. And I mean, I guess maybe that relationship with Marv Goo and then even post, you know, his career with, with John McKay, did that sort of help you kind of build that bond with all the head coaches since then? So you kind of know like, hey, I have a job here too, and we're, we can work together, and I can be a real benefit to the football team. Oh, oh there, there is no doubt, and 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 John, you know, John was just, uh, he was just wonderful. He loved music. Uh, his wife at that time was uh, a music major, and there was a whole relationship there. You know, I'd see him at concerts. And he'd come over band practice just, you know, all the time, unannounced, and just sit on the end of the benches there and just, you know, watch band practice. And so it, it was just kind of a natural. And, and then after that, every new coach, uh, you know, the word, the word got out, you know, that, you know, after the president hires you, the next guy you got to talk to is the band director. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get the band involved. You got to keep this tradition. And and I, I, I really am honored to say that I became very close with all the coaches. Uh, Ted Tolner and and we'll talk about them later. But Ted, Larry Smith, uh, of course, John returns. 
uh, even Paul Hackett, and of course, you know, you know Pete Pete Carroll yeah. was, was uh, he was like a band kid, you know, he was bouncing around and he was just terrific. Yeah, all the energy there. He he brought a lot of it. So yeah, we'll look forward to some some future episodes when we talk with uh, about some of those guys and your relationship with them. Uh, but that's so great. 1974 season, obviously some really cool memories and cool games there with some iconic mm -hmm. plays. Uh, but we want to go switch over to the second part of the podcast, which we've been doing this. We'll keep doing this where the second part will be about some of the Trojan marching band traditions. And uh, this one's about the game day traditions. And so I'll put up, uh, for those on video, I'll put up a slide uh, for the, uh, the Cromwell field. So the first one we're going to talk about is Every week, you know, on the Saturday, practice begins 7 a.m. on Cromwell Field. Doesn't matter what time the game is, bye week, whatever, practice 7 a.m. Uh, on Cromwell Field. How, maybe talk about that tradition a little bit there, Dr. Bartner. Well, you know, this this tradition uh, got started because, because the band, college kids, you know, they go out Friday night before a game and they party. So... Uh, with the leaders of the band, we decided to call a seven o'clock in the morning practice. You know, rain, shine, uh, whatever the situation, time of the game, we would have this early morning rehearsal and we would wake everybody up. And if you overdid it the night before, you were gonna pay. And uh, so this has become our tradition, and it's been uh, – we've done this every day on the road at home, and uh, it, it enables us to have a very good rehearsal yeah. Saturday morning. The uh, So on the road games, is it just like outside the hotel, or where do you guys end up meeting uh, for those road games? Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we find either a local high school or a junior college – and uh, we rehearse there. We, for example, Berkeley High School, which is very close to the stadium. Uh, I think it's uh, San Mateo uh, Junior College. We rehearse there before the Stanford game. Okay. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's that's what we do. We we get them up. We always feed them breakfast. You know, college kids have a habit of skipping breakfast. And you can't go through a long game day without having some a good hearty breakfast. So uh, that's the first order of business. Well, the so the second tradition, um, and this is uh, I, you know I, this is a great one that when uh, we would do our tailgates for uscfootball.com, seeing the band coming through. But it starts two hours before kickoff uh, at Heritage Hall, so people gather there and. Uh, is this sort of where like the, the initial meeting point is and then that kind of initial concert for the band? Yes, we, we have, uh, and this is a tradition that's developed through the years. And uh, uh, it's it's kind of like the, the Pipe Piper. You know, we start at Heritage Hall and it gives us a review of our show for family, friends, alumni, uh, obviously, we play Tusk and the fight songs, and then we start our march through campus, and we pick up the Trojan faithful on the way to the Coliseum. We stop at the Associates' picnic. Uh, we stop in front of Bovard and, uh, you know, give a rock concert, and it's, it's, it's just kind of neat the way we just pick everybody up and kind of march to the Coliseum. Yeah. the uh, You mentioned Bovard, and that's when we used to do our uscfootball.com tailgates on campus. We would have like a tent near Tommy Trojan, and a bunch of USC mm -hmm. fans would sort of come out. And one of the highlights was always, and I think it was about usually about like an hour and a half or something before kickoff or somewhere in that range, an hour, uh, 15, right. something like that. And the band would come through, and everyone would set up. You know, it would set up and just be – sprawled out you know along the street and you'd have the the song girls would come out and you're right there next to the band and so the like we bring friends in from out of town or something that maybe haven't been to a mm. game and we would have them at the tailgate and that was always one of the highlights we'd show them and they just loved the fact that the band was kind of right there in front of them playing this concert for everyone that was tailgating on campus 
Yeah, yeah. It's it's a wonderful tradition. I, I mean, uh, you know, it, it's like the Trojan family gathering. Yeah, you know, yeah. There's Bovard in the background, and uh, you know, yeah. Obviously, we start with the the fight songs, and we end with conquest, and and in the middle, we give them a little rock concert, and always play Tusk, and, and it's the you know the the crowd is requesting tunes, play a heartbreaker, play kids, play Tusk. So it, it's just, it, it's a gathering of the Trojan family, which is just neat. And, and then I stand on a ladder and lead the SoCal spell out. Um, I think I'm the oldest surviving yell leader in the history of collegiate football. <laughs> uh, but I guess I'm a kid at heart, so I enjoy it. 80 year old kid at heart. Yeah, that's great. It's good to see your energy. Um, so, from you know the, the concerts on campus, you said you play in front of the Associates picnic and stuff and in front of Bovard. Then now it's the march to the Coliseum. And it's sort of like we knew you kind of have to need to pack up the tailgate and stuff once the band had left. And you know, that's that was sort of the, the mark of, okay, you know, now you got to get ready to go to the game. And the band's walking over to the game. And this is one of the great traditions that, um, you know, we talked about a, a bunch before, is just the kicking of the flagpole when you're crossing the street and heading over, uh, you know, to go to, you know, crossing exposition, going over to the Coliseum. Right. Um, but, yeah, maybe talk about that, the uh, the flagpole kicking tradition. Yes, this is this is really a, a student tradition that the band, you know, for some reason – started to kick this flagpole. There's three flagpoles. And, and, and the more games they kicked it, and the more seasons, then our, our fan base also started to kick the flagpoles. And uh, it, it, this has become a tradition that if you got to kick the flagpoles for good luck. And uh, an interesting sidelight that Mike Bone, our new athletic director, I had him on the phone about a month ago, and he said, tell me where these flagpoles are. I'm new to campus. And where? So I had to describe, well, it's down, you know, you know, this street, and before you cross Exposition Boulevard, and, 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 and he said, I will start kicking these flagpoles before every game now. Nice. All right. So yeah, that's uh, the new AD. He's got it. Mike Bones got to get in on that because that is a that is a good one. I, I mean, I don't know anyone as they're walking over to Coliseum as fans. Everyone tries to do it. It's not like something people like ah. I mean, that's that's one that's just universally accepted now. It seems. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And and it's the, and I think it's called Truesdale. I remember the street now. Truesdale. Yeah. And, uh, yes. Uh, the only thing you know originally it was you know kind of a a light, uh, you know, it, it wasn't a solid metal. It's almost like cellophane, and you know, we we're everybody's kicking this thing, and all of a sudden it gets all dented up. Yeah. So now it's concrete, <laughs> and and you just got to be careful how hard you kick this because you'll hurt yourself. I've heard of a few injuries, so maybe there was a few adult beverages, maybe you know, before the game, and uh, people hurt themselves. But don't hurt yourself, with your, but you do want to kick the flagpole. It's one of the great uh, game day traditions, and it's yeah. good. That's cool that the hear the band was a big part of that. Um, the tunnel run is the next one we want to talk about, which is interesting. So let me get this. So it's cool when we're in the Coliseum, like we're in the press box you can kind of hear the band sort of coming down the tunnel, but you guys get there and play for the team in the tunnel as they're exiting the locker room to go warm up, right? Is that where this starts? Yes. We, you know, we're on a schedule. You have to be on a schedule because uh, you don't want to get caught in the tunnel the same time with our team and especially the opponents. You don't want to get mixed up in that. So we so we usually arrive about a half an hour before kickoff, and both teams are, are are already out. Sometimes we catch the end of our our team and play for them. Uh, we take a quick water break, and then uh, once the tunnel is cleared, we start this run. 
And, and, and again, this, uh, you know, a lot of these traditions, I give the students the credit because we had traditionally marched down the tunnel. You know, most bands either walk down or they march down. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, there's some students taking off and starting to run. And, and, you know, so I'm watching this. And so I'm saying, well, you know, why don't we do this as a band? And we have certain rules, uh, you know, how far you can run. You cannot run through the drum line because, because it, you know, it's hard for them to run and still play the drums at the same time. So, and they're carrying big instruments, so you can't run through them. It's dangerous. So, uh, so we do this, and the energy of the band running down the fields, running down the tunnels, screaming and hollering, uh, I think is very audible on the field where the team is warming up. And uh, I've heard many times that uh, when the team hears the band, it's like, okay, it's time to get going. You know, it's this game. Let's, let's wrap this up and, you know, play this ball game. Yeah, you could definitely hear it coming uh, when we're up at the press box, at, you know, the open air. You can hear like, oh, here comes a band and they're coming down there. Um, we're going to talk about the in-game sort of traditions on a later episode because there's a lot of those, like we mentioned at the top. But post-game, you know, USC wins the game. Uh, they have a concert on on the field, and the team comes over. And this is one of the cooler traditions, too. We've seen so many different players and coaches climb up that ladder, uh, grab the sword uh, from the – you know, and get – you know, to be able to lead the band uh, for conquest. So – Maybe talk about how this one started, and it's uh, it's it's one that's really popular. So many iconic pictures of different players uh, leading the band. Yeah, well, this is my this is my favorite moment. Uh, you know, people people ask me all the time, "What's your favorite moment of of the football game of uh, you know your career?" Your your it's this moment, and again, it's it's the gathering of the Trojan family. I'm a firm believer of the Trojan family because you got the team, you got the band, you got the student body, and then you got the, the fans in the Coliseum that, you know, have come over to this side of the field and, and, and we celebrate together. And the catalyst is obviously this player. And we try to get the star of the player to get on the ladder and he holds the sword, conducts conquest. And, and it's just a, and that's the mellophone section in, in front of the band uh, playing the horn calls to conquest. And it's just this great moment. And, and you're right. Uh, a lot of times, this gets picked up by television. Uh, there's always photographers on the bottom, so it's uh, it's just ver it's worth staying after the game to see this moment, to be part of this moment. Yeah, and it's a drum. It's the actual drum major sword, right? It's a, it's not it's heavy. Yes, yes. There, it's interesting. You know, we've had. Uh, uh, Yes, some very young players, uh, you know, freshmen, sophomores. And number one, they're kind of shocked how high this ladder is. And number two, how heavy the sword is. So, uh, and I'm always, uh, you know, I get my guys around me. And, and because the last thing I want to do is for a player to fall off a ladder, you know, and, and then I got to go to the coach and go, geez, I'm sorry, you know, your, your player just sprained his ankle <laughs> coming down the ladder. So I am very sensitive, not so much going up, but coming down is not something you would do every day. So uh, we're very protective of the player and this tradition. Yeah. And the, the sword itself. So we had India Anderson uh, in here in my studio when she first was named 
uh, the first female, you know, drum major, and she brought uh, the sword in and was kind of showing it around. But she wouldn't let me like hold it to see how heavy it was. It's very, you know, there's there's traditions around that where it's like she's got to handle it, but it's okay for like the player or the coach to get up on. But I'm sure she's watching them as they're doing it. Yes, it is is truly an honor to hold that sword, and and it is not meant as something you pass around and you let alumni hold it and something you know, uh, you know. If, if you want to hold that sword, you have to make a donation, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's it, you, it, it's yours. It's got to be go every place you go. Wow. And uh, I remember there was one Notre Dame game where the drum major, you know, forgot the sword <laughs> in his hotel room, and we're you know pulling out of Chicago. And this guy come, comes up to me and he says, I don't have the sword. <laughs> and I'll tell you, we turned all six buses around. We went back up and we picked up that sword. You just you can't go into battle without your sword. No. Man, that, the six buses must not have been too happy with them. <laughs> no, but it was, there was a lot of upset bus drivers at the time. Nice. Well, that's a great tradition, obviously. Uh, this one I didn't really know uh, as much about. Um, usually we're kind of you know working after the games, but on your march back, there's also uh, like a smaller concert over at Tommy Trojan in the middle of campus, sort of like a last concert of the day. Yeah. Yeah, there's a – and before that, there's this cool thing that, you know, on the march back, each section kind of plays a little tune, Uh the trumpets play joy to the world. Uh, the trombones are playing the wedding march as they march by the Rose Garden. So there's the troopers are playing Darth Vader's theme. So there's all these little things, these tippets of musical uh, phrases that are going on. And then when we get to Tommy Trojan, we stop and we, we play Conquest one last last time to our and and you know pay tribute to Tommy and uh, we we have a, a group of very loyal fans. A lot of them are 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 parents of band kids that have stuck through this. But uh, we have a nice little crowd and uh, we play Conquest one last time. Nice. And then the final thing, and I'm sure like by now. After the seven, you know, breakfast, seven a.m. wake up call. Maybe it's a late game. Everything that happens on, still everyone has to go to Heritage Hall uh, before they get dismissed. It, exactly. It's uh, you know we line up in front of Heritage. I usually bring them in. I bring them in tight. You know, I, I give them a last pep rally, uh, pep talk, and 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 thank them for what a great job they did today. And then uh, we sing our fight song. The football team sings the fight song in their locker room. We sing it in front of Heritage Hall and uh, they play the third chorus. And then I dismiss the band. Yeah, that's uh, probably a sense of relief from some of those band members after like a, a pretty long, I'm sure it's fun, but it's gotta be a really long day. Well, you know, the first guys to leave after the dismissal are the tuba players. <laughs> they can't wait. You know, I mean, you have to, you know, next time you, you see a tuba player, give them a hug. Because they've been lugging that thing around all day. And, and uh, you know, you got to give them a lot, of, a lot of credit. But those, are, I, as I watch, and I stay until the last guy leaves Heritage Hall. Because they meet in their little their sections, so so most of the guys, you know, the drummers meet and they play something for themselves. And there's there's all these what I call sectional traditions that happen after dismissal. But the tubas, you know, single file, you can <laughs> see them, and they just can't wait until they get to the pavilion and hang the tuba up, and then they have their meeting. Sure. I'm sure that, you know, 15 hours getting yelled at by you, I'm sure they're like ready to be. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Very true. Is there um, any 
sort of feedback or would, like some would maybe some of the leaders come to you, you know what, we did this, but I think this would have worked better or I feel like this didn't work. I mean, is there any kind of feedback like that where they say something that maybe worked really well or, or they, would, they could have done differently, anything like that? Oh, absolutely. I meet uh, every, more, every Monday, uh, you know, after the weekend, and I meet with, uh, with my leaderships. I meet with my section leaders who represent each section, and, and, and they make suggestions. Well, you know, we could do this better. You know, we like this number. You know, keep this number, play it more, and, and, and so on and so forth. And then on Tuesday after practice, I meet with my teaching assistants, teaching assistants and my assistant directors. And again, you know, we review the game day experience, and then we talk about, you know, what's the next game. So yes, it's it's constantly in 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 motion. And also we look at film. I mean, I you know, like I learned it from Coach Coach McKay and uh, you know John Baxter and I and I've been to some of their sessions, I'm sure you have too, where you know they have an amphitheater and they put up the screen and they circled, God, you missed that block there, and our quarterback got sacked. And on Tuesdays, we do that with the leaders because they're the guys who are out there, uh, you know, watching the drill and uh, teaching the drill and making sure everybody gets the right step off. They're in line. They turn together. And, uh, you know, you know, we'll circle. Well, you know, what's the story with this guy? You know, he's out of line or he went the wrong direction. So we're constantly reviewing and improving and making a better product at halftime. Yeah, just like the football team. Interesting. Um, well, really cool stuff. The 1974 season, obviously, iconic one for USC. And then the uh, game day traditions are great. Uh, I've seen a lot of them, some I didn't know about. So hopefully uh, USC fans are a little more informed uh, when it comes to some of the Trojan marching band uh, game day traditions. I do want to let everyone know uh, you can show your spirit and keep yourself and others healthy with the Trojan marching band face covering. So we all got to wear those now. A portion of the proceeds benefit the USC Student Basic Needs Fund to help students with expenses related to housing, uh, food security, job loss, and other hardships during these uncertain times. You can find it in other Trojan marching band gifts at uscbookstore.com slash spiritoftroy. The bookstore is offering f free shipping on all orders. So that's pretty cool. Check it out. You want a Trojan marching band uh, face covering. I'm sure you have yours, Dr. Barter. Yes, I do. Yes, we had a, a drive-by birthday party. And uh, as a little uh, thank you to all the people who participated, they got this mask. And then the band heard about it and said, where's my mask? <laughs> so now we're going to mail <laughs> Mail them out to 300 band guys. Wow. That's uh, hopefully you don't have to do that. Someone else can lick those uh, envelopes and put their stamps on there. Yeah. Yeah. You're up 50 years. You got a lot of people that can do that for you. So that's good. Yeah. Nice. Well, Dr. Barter, anything else on the last season? It's been a great uh, episode. This was a little longer than some of our other ones, but there was so much to uh, talk about for that season and those traditions. Well, thank you. And uh, I enjoy sharing this these moments with uh, the Trojan family. And uh, I, 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 to be honest with you, if you were at that 1974 Notre Dame game, you will never forget it. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, I mean, who else score, you know, scores that many points in 17 minutes. So. Yeah. And AD, he's, uh, I mean, yeah, he was crazy in his Notre Dame career. Like, Notre Dame fans to this day will mention it, like, oh, Anthony Davis. Like, he's three years of that. Like, they didn't, they didn't want any more of him. <laughs> well, I think Ara Parsegian, uh, I think he retired after that game. He did, yeah. Seen enough. Yeah. So, that was his last one against USC. So, that was, uh, it's a good right. way. You always want to send, like, a, a rival coach out on a, on a bad note. I think USC got to do that to Lou Holtz as well and a crazy another one. So I don't know if that'll be part of our series, but that was a crazy game too, breaking the, the Notre Dame streak. Yes. Oh, yeah. We should talk about that because it's the only time that I remember 
that the crowd went over the walls. I mean, and it was it was bedlam. And of course, I'm going like this to the band. You, know? I mean, <laughs> you guys can't go over these walls there. Stay there and play the tunes. So, uh, yeah, that was that was definitely a crazy game. Crazy great. We'll have to talk to Brett, see if we can add that one to the list if it's not on there already. But we got, we'll, uh, we'll keep doing these every week. This is uh, uh, week three, episode three of our 12 part mm -hmm. series. So, uh, so far the feedback has been great. We appreciate everyone out there uh, watching and listening and make sure you check out the Trojan Marching Band uh, uh, YouTube page. We'll keep putting these up every week. But Dr. Bartner, great stuff. Thanks again uh, for doing this. Well, thank you, Ryan. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Fight on! All right, fight on, everyone. Thanks for joining.